Texas, of course. Can I just um, interrupt you? I'm very sorry, uh, Leon, um, but for some reason we were not started. So oh. now we have started. So thank you very <laughs> much to Louis, who commented to say that we hadn't started. I had pressed the button, but it didn't seem to work. I hope you can see us now. Hello, everyone. We're going to start again from the start. No my name is Anna Wise. <laughs> okay, he can see us now. That's great. Uh, my name is Anna Wise. I'm the moderator for today's uh, discussion. We are, of course, talking about the COVID pandemic and its impact uh, or its force and the force of impact investigating. Uh, sorry, impact investing. Uh, now, 2020 um, is, an, is a year that nobody really uh, could anticipate. And for all that it has brought us in times, terms of crisis, it's also been marked by a willingness to change from the increasing use of uh, formats like this so that we can work from home, that we can hold webinars from home, to also highlighting um, the movements already in existence, which is, of course, impact investing. Um, now, we talked a little bit about our 2020 Global Impact Investing Network survey, which said that 70% of respondents to the market is growing steadily, while another 20% of those surveyed said the market is about to take off. So it's a great opportunity for us all to discuss. And I'm going to introduce everybody again, which is great because Scott's now with us too. Scott, we had a false start, so now we're restarting. Um, so I'm delighted that you're also here. Uh, we'll start again with Ben Banerjee. Give us a wave, Ben. Swiss Impact Hi. Investment Association here in Switzerland. We also have Claire Chen. Give us a wave, Claire, Managing Partner at iSource Consulting Group in Taiwan. Rodria Laline, Chairwoman of Intrabon Capital from Amsterdam. And we have uh, Scott Mackin, Managing Partner of Denham Capital Management. Give us a wave, Scott, so everyone knows who you are. And we have Leon To, who is Executive Director of Damson Capital in uh, Singapore. And I, I did kick off the first question already. It's, it's an opportunity for us all to kind of give off our positions on impact investing before we get stuck into the nitty gritty. Uh, but um, I, I did ask Leon, again, I'll start with you. Has COVID-19 been the accelerator that impact investing never knew it needed? <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. And uh, it's great because I, I got to practice the first question beforehand <laughs> already, so it worked out. Um, so th thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you, Hannah, for moderating and for Bryce's for having me. I think the, the question on impact investments is absolutely critical at this juncture, especially for COVID-19, which is a really tragic situation, challenging time for so many people. And especially for us here in Asia, I think it's help refine uh, a lot of people's thoughts around what they want in the world, what's important for them, you know, from something as simple as wearing a mask on an individual level to the fact that they can put every dollar towards impact investing for transformative change and for ESG guided leadership in companies. And I think that's been wonderful because we've been seeing different, um, you know, different elements of companies, you know, being put forth during the COVID-19 of how they are trying to care for vulnerable people, their employees and the environment around them. So I think... I think uh, Leon's just lost connection a little bit. So if we could just uh, jump on. Uh, Claire, I can see that you might have something to say there. Would you like to pick up? What's your position on impact investing? Oh. Uh, actually, digging on the uh, the data for um, the uh, Global Impact Investing Network, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to increasing the scale uh, effectiveness of the impact investing. And I think this, we don't even know, we didn't predict the coronavirus will come in, you know, so soon by this year, but actually um, the last off, uh, five AUM, targeting years, impact investments. Um, <laughs> and I think in, in that, that regard, you know, the, um, what we're seeing today with impact investments on the social impact, um, network itself is that we're starting to see a lot of investors swing towards not just environmental impact investment leadership, but social impact investment leadership, asking questions like how many jobs, how many more jobs are we creating or how are we stemming the tide of vulnerable populations and tackling poverty issues? Especially when you have a backdrop of countries like Indonesia, where I'm next to, where we are seeing a shift and an addition of almost 5.5 to 8 million more Indonesians going to poverty because of the economic downturn. But so I think there are great opportunities, especially in the world of impact investments, on the basis that there are short term pains right now for remote communities who are disconnected. But in fact, I think 
this is the opportunity where you're going to see a lot of upside with digitization and closing of the um, connectivity gaps. And we're going to be forcing a lot of remote communities and seeing a lot of their adoption rates on technology-based essential services coming through. And I think that's going to accelerate either digitization or bringing communities closer together. And I think um, that's been great. So I think for, for me, I think the final words on, on setting the tone for impact investments in the new world is really the role for what we are all about. And I think that's really about standing up for something in impact investments for LPs, entrepreneurs, and everyone to stand up for the SDGs and for impact investments to make it a more equitable world. Um, and it's not the fact that we're against poverty, which I think what is what a lot of people stood for in the last 10, 20 years. It's not about standing against something or you know, for po against poverty, but it's really the fact that we're standing up for something, which is empowerment and transformation of the environment and communities on the ground. And I think that's very, very much what uh, impact investment is all about. And I think it's given opportunities for even our portfolio companies who are in green logistics, where we're starting to see more people switch out and opt for greener options and, you know, supporting, you know, youth at risk, marginalized youth employment there. So I, I think it's a great time for impact investing. All right, we'll leave it there for, for now, Leon. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, while you were reconnecting there, we had a quick word with Claire. So I'll, I'll hand back to Claire to continue. Well, since uh, Leon has been covered uh, quite a lot already, so I'll just take you know, a quick talk about, um, I think more than five years ago, um, way before the COVID-19 coming over, we all noticed that, we all realized that our Mother Earth really needed do something for impact. So impact investing is really important according to all the investors, uh, private equity or venture capital or family office, even the personal uh, investment. Then we all consider about what is the best, and not just only looking at the return on investment, most important, what kind of project, what kind of the impact we can do. So actually, this, uh, we didn't forget about this COVID-19 since this year is a COVID-19 um, that it doesn't really uh, affect the much about the impact investing. But of course, uh, the data talk even more about the this year, actually more investment uh, uh, Put it into the uh, impact investing uh, area. So, um, like uh, invest in impact investing uh, as a approach, uh, the thinking behind will have a much greater interest in among the investors. And um, which is the impact investing this year uh, in response to the COVID nineteen pandemic, the most plan to stick the strategies focused and addressing like the uh, UN's uh, sustainable. Uh, development goals, and that, that's our guidelines. Rodria, how much do the sustainable development goals really play in all of this? Um, I think... Sorry, Claire, this were questions for, for Rodria. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, you're asking about the impact of uh, uh, impact investing. Um, basically, what, I'm, what I see is that investors now are looking at two things. Um, particularly, we look at the fund and ESG sector expertise that is necessary in this area. Um, it's uh, I'm um, my background is in corporate governance, so basically I focus much more on the governance, corporate governance, the board structure, uh, the accountability, accounting, and disclosure practices. And there you see that a lot of things have to be done because you need. Uh, uh, you need an accelerator and the corporate behavior in this area. So basically, one has to focus much more in the area of uh, of governance to uh, to see that boards are serious with regard to ESG developments. Um, you see this uh, in two ways, and that is um, when you look at the annual reports, you can basically um, define a taxonomy for what it means, ESG, and look if the words are in their uh, annual report. And this has been done at IMD, and they have noticed that um, there's a lot of talking about it, but not really, really transparent with regard to what happens, you know, what, what is reported. Um, uh, another thing is that you... In corporate governance, you need to see uh, uh, sustainability committees established, driven by the board. So 
uh, a tone at the top, at least to, to say, you know, this is serious and we have to look at it. Um, ESG is environment, social and governance. And I agree with Leon that there's lots of uh, emphasis also in the social area. And particularly, I would like to refer to uh, something that happened in the United States recently, uh, um, in June 23, 2020. The Department of Labor updated uh, the Investment Duties Guide for Employee Retirement Income Security Act, um, called ERISA in the in uh, in the U.S. Um, fiduciaries there have now to address environmental, social, and corporate governance investments, and there's lots of discussions about that because um, um, should we spend the money? Uh, how's the money spent? When, uh, when these uh, big uh, uh, labor uh, um, retirement income is, uh, is, is invested, uh, will it also comply with ESG, yes or no? Um, if a fiduciary can show that the ESG option is equivalent or superior to its non-ESG peers when evaluated on financial criteria, such as expenses, risk factors, historical rates or return, the investment is permitted, but um, the letter is hard to prove. So at the moment, we are not at the same uh, level um, uh, playing field as what we say, you know, uh, general um, uh, sustainability uh, investments in companies. We are don't we don't have the the, the right taxonomy really to to judge and see if uh, if we are doing the right thing. Um, we need much more to look at. What does it mean to move from exclusion uh, investments to um, basically inclusion investments? Uh, so, ex, ex, you know, um, inclusion investments is more do we all uh, align with the things that we are doing uh, and moving from uh, inclusion investments to impactful investments? Um, there you need active ownership, basically. So, um, Instead of uh, uh, only looking at how to, you know, how to follow an index, uh, it's also active management in uh, uh, can we really move on and uh, take active ownership and do a stock picking that's really compliant with what we see ESG should be. I think we'll dig into governance a little bit later. Thank you very much for your introductory remarks for now, though, Rodria. Ben, if I can turn to you. <laughs> I, I think that the three people before me, they, they, they really addressed it very correctly. So, and, and also on the base level. So I'll pull myself up a bit uh, on a macro level. So what COVID in my understanding has done, it has, it has speedened up the demise of the present economic system. Because if you look at SARS, Ebola, COVID, and this is maybe just be the beginning, because they are becoming more frequent, and that's thanks to the climate change and the mass destruction of the nature and biodiversity. So if you look, and then I'll just point to two points. One is that if you look at the World Bank figures, this tiny virus has wiped out 5.2% of the global economy, from which 7% is from the advanced economies. So what damage would the next pandemic hit? And so what is certain in this is that our present economical model cannot sustain or survive this. So it's a high time we have to think different. And I'm personally aware that countries like UK, Netherlands, Finland, they're working at it. And the second point I'd like to make is that the exploding risk to the financial in uh, investments for every cent invested in unsustainable business is creating higher loss. For example, if you look at the economic damage caused by the forest fires in US, in Australia, in Indonesia, who is going to pocket those bills? The taxpayers? So, and why should we invest in oil wells or coal power stations when we know that they are going to be obsolete within the next 20, 30 years and they can't even repay, repay their own debts? So, so this carbon uh, risk in the portfolio is where people are looking for. The financial, it is, uh, I think the number which you mentioned, 700 billion, is not really correct because I think it has crossed 800 billion already, thanks to, I would say, thanks to COVID. But also, we should keep in mind that that uh, impact investment is, is through all sectors. It's extremely difficult to measure it. And what Jin basically does is Jin me measures the companies which are directly have the core business impact investment. But there are also many companies which are indirectly or directly impacted or who are busy with impact investment. They're not in this number. So I'm sure this number is far higher. 
And the positive side is if you look at Tesla, which has become now the, 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 the biggest car company. And on the other hand, Exxon has been booted out of the Dow's, uh, Dow Jones industrial. So the, you see already the market movement. Okay, well, I mean, let's just pick up on that and dig a bit deeper then, Scott. Um, some critics believe that, you know, ESG and this idea of impact investing doesn't actually really move the needle on the biggest issues facing our planet at the moment. What do you say to that? Well, I think that um, COVID has amplified, accelerated the energy transition. So all you have to do is look at the amount of money that is being pulled out of the oil and gas space. Shell's market cap is less than half of what it was before. It, it had been supported by dividends, which have proven unsustainable. BP has faced the same issue, Total, and on and on. And so um, it's, it's accelerated that. Um, and you, I, I think the, the, the comments that were made about EVs and Tesla and everything are really important. I, I do think that people have, have now paid attention to the fact that we've got a couple of problems here. One is, you know, if you look at uh, two key SDGs, one is to help alleviate poverty, and two um, is to uh, minimize global warming effects. Those two have been, been conflicting to date, because if you look at the Human Development Index, or if you look at GDP growth, or whatever, and you, your X and your Y axis, um, the countries who've done the better job alleviating poverty have done it in a very carbon intensive way. And that's our past. That's 20% of the world's population. So a lot of efforts are going now to sort of amplify the energy transition there, where they don't need new energy, but they need to replace old energy, which has its problems. Uh, but there are positive dollars that will go into EV charging stations, data centers, which could represent 20% of electricity demand by 2035. Those are going to be green. So that's clear. I mean, I think, you know, without a doubt, no matter where they are, they're going to be green. But that ignores 80% of the world's population that has not climbed up that ladder yet. And we have to make sure that when they do that, that's not in that same carbon intensive way. Thankfully, wind and solar have now become the lowest cost form of electricity um, available in those countries. Um, and, and so that's, that, you know, that is very timely. And so, so it's not any longer being driven by regulatory or um, green, greenhouse gas concerns. It's being driven by pure economics. And so that's a coalescence. People who have invested in oil and gas, so the large, um, now I'm talking about the limited partner, the big institutional investors, um, um, whether they've done the stock markets or privates or anything else, they haven't done well. And they're scrambling right now to find out how to do better. And I think you'll find more and more money going into sustainable infrastructure across across the full band. But undoubtedly, it is quite messy out there. There are still a lot of issues to address. Uh, number one issue, there is no one method to assess um, how environmental or socially relevant an investment is. And that is changing. But do we need, do you think, a global benchmark, Leon? Um, th that's a great question, Hannah. I think um, the the challenge we have in, in the, the methodology, of course, um, has taken time. Uh, there are uh, quite a few uh, different uh, good practices and best practices being developed. So, for example, IFC has put together with their green bonds, you know, um, best practices around, you know, how green is green enough, how social is social enough. And I think that, you know, as we start developing all these uh, different insights and testing it and exploring it, we will definitely sharpen uh, the, the sword on, you know, how we actually measure it. And I think um, that there have been a lot of different parties setting the standards for, uh, these different, um, uh, you know, impact driven, um, investments. And I think, you know, we're starting to also have investors understand that how critical it is to be asking these types of questions of how social and how green enough are you, especially with trying to deliver on uh, climate change and uh, carbon, you know, footprints. I think that that's the right question to be asking. I think that that shift in asking the questions is already going to not only deliver the change we're looking for in SDGs, but really the change in and the targeting of innovative alpha that we are looking for in the financial markets as well. And I think that, they, you know, it does come hand in hand. If you are asking these ESG questions, you will naturally also get 
um, the, the very um, converging and growing uh, returns from it as well. But if everybody is trying their best to address this and come up with good standards, these standards are all still going to be different. Do we need a global benchmark? Rodria, maybe you can answer this. Um, absolutely. Um, we really need a, a global benchmark. Uh, um, it's obviously that it's obvious that we have to achieve a risk sensitive regulatory capital framework. So what it actually means is that um, um, we uh, all our capital flows are cross border and we have to avoid market fragmentation, basically. So to overcome fragmentation or ring fencing of capital and liquidity, it's critical to have an effective, therefore, Europe, in Europe, particularly a European banking union and a capital markets union. Um, these two have to work to, together um, and have not been uh, effective as we expected uh, up till today. And what's needed uh, are local supervisory measures against ring fencing. So less divergence of standards and less obstacle ob obstacles um, uh, with impact investing funneling into the real economy. Um, that's something good for the Euro and the Eurozone. But um, you see that particularly when we are going to deflationary areas, uh, you see lots of capital moving into capital markets and don't go into the real economy. So we don't bridge, we don't build infrastructure or we don't do anything for, for a better world, put in this way. And when you can't move all that money, um, then we are asking everyone to align and reform. So in the, in Europe, for example, there's the southern part of Europe and the northern part of Europe and the southern part of Europe. We put it in this, Hello? Yes, I think uh, Rodri is just frozen for a Line minute. And, and um, so I'm going to give her. And Northern oh, yes. Europe must reform to promote productivity and wage growth. Um, so, what it basically means is we are. Oh, what happens? Everybody is. I don't know. There's a, we seem to have a, a loose connection, but please carry on, Rodri, while you're still connected. Okay, so um, at least uh, we must, uh, how you say that, um, we, we give uh, now, we have a Marshall Plan in Europe for helping the Southern Europe and our Southern members in the European uh, member states. That Marshall Plan um, is about 750 to 800 billion and basically uh, uh, it addresses one, I think 1.8 trillion dollars or something like that. But um, we are asking the Southern Europe to also reform and reform means that you have to look at the digital economy and the green economy. And uh, there you have the problems coming up because uh, what's the status of being digital or at least have moved in the digital transitions or the uh, uh, or the green transition. So even the, uh, the, the, the EU, you know, the EU Green Deal um has to be addressed and you see in finance that we do a hell of a lot already uh, we have the ipsf the international platform for sustainable finance we have now uh, the ngfs a network for greening the financial system so there's lots of initiative to finally arrive at what you call a global benchmark okay so mm -hmm. europe is doing a lot um already but claire maybe you could kind of fill us in about your part of the world in taiwan and asia in general um how aligned are they with europe how aligned is europe with asia uh, what kind of status do we have uh, if we compare the two sides and i just before you answer that i just want to say to our audience welcome thank you for being there send you questions if you'd like to add a question to the team claire um, um, my background is from the uh, west and um, to the east, so um, more like the uh, US and uh, Europe to the Asia, so more focused on the greater China. So what I can contribute, I think, to for this uh, impact investing for this climate change and uh, uh, about uh, the reform, the investment to put into the, uh, the green or digitalized, I think, um, there are a, a, a variety of the financial uh, institutions play a, a role in the climate 
financing. I think that's very important. If we, besides governors and besides the private, which is the uh, each country has a uh, uh, supervised and the organization can form together and to 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 do this in in in, in, in pay investing. So uh, I think that both public and private funding is needed to address uh, the scale of the environment, mental challenges facing people and the planet. And uh, impact investor across from the uh, the returns and are all uh, investing in a climate action that can be including a few points, such as bank and the private financial institutions and uh, the institution uh, asset owners, including the personal funds, insurance company, and sovereign uh, wealth funds, private wealth uh, advisors, and family office, foundations, development finance uh, institutions, and public agency, international development organization has to come by uh, united together. So then uh, there's a guideline so we can do this uh, impact investing uh, in the more uh, focus in, 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 in the wide way, right direction. Okay. And I wonder, actually, how inflows into impact investing uh, differ around the world. Scott, maybe you can kind of help me um, understand that a bit more. If we, I want to address about the, uh, for from a Taiwan market in Asia, now the they are uh, more focused on not just digitalizing, they're looking for the, uh, uh, the, the, the eco-tech agricultures, and the uh, the impact investing in the clean energy. What I'm looking at in the Asia Pacific, uh, for example, uh, my my me and my partners, we are involved in managing the projects uh, related to the clean energy and the uh, sustainable sustainable commercial base uh, real estate development. So okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Claire, uh, Scott. Sure. Well, I think you know. It's difficult to get to global standards when you can't get a president to obey by debate rules um, <laughs> or any sort of norms of decency. Um, and uh, and so I, you know, I, I think that is you can't let perfection be the enemy of good. I think in general, both across the board of how people invest, which your question, Hannah, and I'll get into it, and how we address standards. I think full disclosure. Um, rather than arbitrary uh, guidelines because there'll be a lot of bucking that trend. So full disclosure is always best. It's the way that environmental permitting is run under the IFC performance standards to be discussing things. And so so I think that that is the main, and I think you'll get a lot less sort of rackling against it. There are huge differences d- directly to your question, Hannah, about how how people in, are investing in impact. And, I, and I'm glad to hear uh, the comment before about ERISA standards maybe being different, but I think that's only a small step because um, look at the so massive amounts, trillions of dollars being managed by U.S. pension plans, most of whom are sort of underpaid people who are trying to stay afloat uh, in terms of their portfolios on a quarter by quarter basis. And they've been given buckets because somebody on top has told them, you know, you're going to get 20% in alternatives or 25% in alternatives of that. You know, so much is going to be hedge funds and this and that and correlation. And right now, there's very small buckets for impact um, in, in that massive amount of money. And I think the same is true as you look into many of the sovereign wealth funds. Um, and even, you know, another major source of, of uh, funding is U.S. endowment funds. You know, so, you know, how much pure impact funding is coming out of that. So so I think what has to happen uh, is that there needs to be, and I hate, hate to use the word, I apologize, you can give me dirty looks, a more of a holistic approach where people are actually thinking about um, the linkage of sustainability and long-term investing and looking at what happened when they invested in oil and gas as an example of, oh, I got all the numbers, except it didn't work out, right? It didn't work, but all the numbers look great. Um, and I looked at all their past records and they're all good because people are going to have to plow more money into sustainable investments. In my field, it's more sustainable infrastructure, but across the board. But, you know, even in even in Europe, now I, you know, I had a conversation uh, two years ago with one of the AP funds 
out of Sweden, um, so large buckets of money, where this guy's got infrastructure and he's got <clears throat> private equity and he's got some people who are impact per se, but they're really more ESG people. And he's trying to get everybody to coalesce around, well, why don't we just decide what we can do together that's good? And he couldn't bring that AP to do that at that point. So um, this is where all the money is that people are deploying. And until you can get them to get that affirmative view, you know, then we're dealing with pockets of money. You're gonna, I'm sorry, Hannah, you were going to No, say no, that. no. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in because, you know, I, I, I very much feel that the fact that um, impact investing is such a long-term investment, yeah. um, you know, people kind of have to wait and see how it goes before they're willing to en masse as institutional investors jump on board. Ben, do you have, have a, a thought on that? Oh, I, I, before I start, I'll just comment on Audrey. Um, uh, it's, it's not that positive that came out of Europe. Uh, number one, North Europe, um, I have a big question mark whether they can push through the governance model on South Europe. I think they will be pushed back and they, it won't happen. And maybe I'm a bit pessimist about it in reality. And secondly, a lot of money that is being put into this this fund, which is created to support the economies of South Europe, unfortunately, a big part of that money has been diverted out of money that was meant for climate change and uh, the Green Deal. So these are the, some of the minor facts which people <laughs> sometimes forget. Now about the standardization, I think what uh, what Scott mentioned is true. We have to. There is a big lack of knowledge of standardization on this. Uh, I speak with the major funds like the sovereign funds, the European Investment Bank, but they are working at their own standardization because till now they work mainly using the OECD standards and things like that, which is basically non-exclusion. That's not really impact investment. So, uh, and I know also the big guys like the PricewaterhouseCoopers and KPMG have also come forward with very, very good tools for impact investment. And um, yeah, so this is changing. There are a lot of tools and standardization coming forward. But what I would like to add to what also Scott said is that there is a new player in the market who has as much money as the pension funds, and in fact, maybe more in most cases, is the religious investors. Uh, the, the, and we, have, we initiated that and it has now started, the religious entities, and they are forcing a lot into impact investment. And are they particularly the, interested in it? Uh, religious investors have been there since thousands of years and and all the religions have uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Laudato Si from the Pope Francis uh, that recently came out he's extremely strong in environmental investments and they are diverting massive assets and the number I have been told is that the religious investors they own 14 percent of the global AUM uh, sorry asset under management so okay. they are not small players they are bigger in total, they're bigger than <laughs> bigger than uh, BlackRock and and Norwegian sovereign. I know, but are they that. actually are they actually interested in impact? Are, are they making moves in impact? Yes, in yes, impact? very, very oh. strongly. Okay, because they have the source. They know yeah. uh, they, their organization models. They have access to projects, businesses which we don't have. We don't know. Okay. We are sitting here, but they are in Africa. They are in Asia. They are everywhere in villages. And okay. they have the source. Only thing is, it's a change of mentality because they have been mainly been working the last thousand plus years as a philanthropic, as a social investments and environment. And now they're clearly going into impact investment because they have themselves noticed that. Uh, may I say something? Yes, Audrey, yeah, please. That, yeah. Yes, I, I, you have to be a bit careful about real estate. Um, uh, and that is because uh, it's a big, large supply chain. And what happened is, um, uh, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation already uh, said this, um, at the end of the value chain, when they deliver something to a client, then when there is money left, uh, part of that money will go into ESG and goes into uh, sustainable investing. Um, they have to change because what they have to do is looking much more to the silos in the value chain and already in each silo uh, should have some circular economy going on there to change it into something that is more sustainable and better for the world. So uh, it should, uh, they should start with um, uh, basically a repository of all material that is used in the supply chain for real estate. And that repository, they're just thinking about it. 
Um, so I'll give you an example. If you use cement for the uh, building uh, offices and building uh, buildings, then all that cement has um, uh, uh, contributed with about 50% of CO2, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. and yeah. this should be changed. So the clinkers in the cement should be replaced by other materials. So already mm -hmm. when you purchase material in real estate, there you should look at, is there enough sustainability going on, enough circularity going on, enough to, to say, you know, if they are serious. At the moment, just talking uh, and not really uh, uh, at the point where you can say there's already material metrics to uh, to uh, to comply with. Yeah, I want to say that at this point we've got about ten, just just under ten minutes left, and there's still a couple of things that I'd like to talk on. But I think that it would be quite interesting for us to quickly go round uh, the room right now and ask how can we um, level up then. What is the next stage? What do we need to do to get more uh, institutional investors on board? What do we need to do to ensure that we have a level playing field? Uh, ben, I'll start with you because you're at the top of my, my screen. <laughs> but I'm going to go around with one with the same question. I would say first is awareness because I think as public, we have become too lazy the last many years that the yeah. bank, we leave the bank and the government manage our pension funds, our savings and everything. We should really become more aware and start asking our banks and our government about the policies and pension funds to to invest and where it is being invested and not just with exclusion policy, but also with better impact investment results, because the funds that we are aware of in the impact sector are performing far better than the market. That's one. And secondly, uh, on the policy level, there are a lot of policies we are working on because we are the ones who also initiated the Green Deal. And we are now working on the implementation of the Green Deal. So uh, we really want to focus on also the uh, how to use the funds and where the funds are finally, because everybody's talking about big amount of trillions and billions and what, but the money is not reaching the projects. The money is not reaching where it should reach. So that has to be better implemented on the policies and the government level. Scott, on to you. So uh, I think, the biggest thing that has to happen, and, and I, I think Ben's comments are, are spot on, is that the money today that is in any sort of sustainable impact investing needs to perform well. I think it will during COVID. I think it'll prove more resilient during COVID uh, because everybody who's putting out those big dollars that we talked about before, they're looking in the rearview mirror. I mean, I know they've got forecasts and everything else. <laughs> but they're really looking in the rearview mirror because that's what protects them from making the decisions as they go forward. So all of us who are in the field have to do well. That's simple. Leon. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that's exactly what I would agree with Scott and, and Ben on as well, that, you know, I think awareness and, and policy is, is one. But I think as we start developing a view into impact investing, it's also developing the lens for impact investing. That's also extremely important of how we identify and I think allow investors to be educated in why we are selecting certain elements within the impact investment portfolios, because those are very much driving against the stigma that impact investments will always give you lower returns and lock you in for much longer. And it's not always the case. I think we will start seeing um, a build out of the ecosystem, the amount of increased liquidity in the market and the, the pipeline of you know, opportunity in very innovative ways, which require innovative lenses of assessment. So I think, I think very much down to the policy and awareness and hopefully then gives them the um, confidence to actually start allocating and actually stipulating very tangible ESG standards in the allocation and in the investment criteria. Claire, on to you, what would you do to kind of raise the profile of impact investing? Uh, like I said, I think, uh, thank you for Ben and Scott and uh, Leon that mentioned that the spot. I think the governors has to work with the uh, this local um, community and the institutions and those private company can come united together then can become a good circular circular economy with the impact for good for all investors uh, and and good for the mother earth and so um, that's a uh, good for in, in investing and Roger, I yeah. need sorry. More, more funds invested to the, to the to the private company what <laughs> Okay, thank you, Claire. Rodria, last word. 
Yes, a couple of things. Uh, we really need what I say a geopolitical dashboard. Um, um, uh, for example, I should know on time, uh, November 28, 20, uh, 2018, the Swedish parliament approved a major reforms requiring the four uh, main national pension funds to become exemplary in the field of sustainable investments failing to integrate uh, basically to ESG issues considered to be a failure of fiduciary duty. So you see that now governments uh, are moving into uh, showing that there is a mandate to move into this area and um, we all have to go into this area. So this geopolitical dashboard is necessary for all other areas. Secondly, we need um, we, we have to put sustainability at the center of how you invest. Because uh, as mentioned earlier by others, climate change and in fact all ESG factors drive profound reassessments of risk and therefore a significant reallocation of capital. Um, uh, sustainability factors are uh, basically reshaping this finance. Um, we go into, and particularly with climate change, into transition risk. We don't know how this, uh, where, which direction this moves but um, it's, it's, it's usually long-term. And third, um, we need a sustainable, resilient and transparent portfolios. Um, I am uh, I'm always supporting uh, more active uh, managed uh, portfolios and passive portfolios. But anyway, um, when I look to uh, um, what uh, Vanguard is doing with regard to ESG ETFs and uh, other areas, then you see it's still in the exclusion screening phase and not moving yet into active ownership. Um, we have to reduce ESG risk in active strategies. We, um, we need uh, ESG analysis uh, and that should be in the heart of risk management and in uh, and building uh, tech platforms for doing this. Um, we also need much better ESG metrics uh, because uh, it's material ESG that's important. Uh, so we need an ESG score and carbon footprint for each fund. Um, okay, so there's obviously still a lot to go on. Last, actually, last, but not least, time. last but not least, I would like to say enhance engagement. Um, look at proxy voting and governance so that you are sure that the boards are supporting this kind of area. And look at transparency in governance and stewardship. So this is my conclusion. Yeah. Okay, so there's obviously a lot more to do. I wanted to ask one more question and I thought we could maybe just everybody just answer at the same time because it's kind of like a yes or no question. I don't know if this will work, but I, I, for me, it's really interesting because I see that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of demand out there, but is there enough supply? Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 Okay, good. That's what I wanted to gauge. All right. Thank you all so much for being part of uh, this uh, panel. I've enjoyed it very much indeed. Apologies for all the technical details. I blame myself for forgetting to press the start button at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's on me. Um, but uh, thank you all very much. It's been great. And uh, yes, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the Horasis event. Bye bye, everyone. Thank bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Oh, now I'm slicking how to get. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye.